Reno, Nevada, 2008. The ground starts shaking and doesn't stop. Days turn into weeks. Weeks become months. But the tremors won't cease. Reno 911. Should we go someplace? Where's the site? For most of 2008, the city and its suburbs are under siege from below. Of course, everyone wants to know, will this earthquake pattern continue? Then, just as mysteriously as they arrive, the earthquakes disappear. But what's causing them, and will they return? The hunt is on to find the answers before the swarm strikes again. In March 2008, scientists at the Nevada Seismological Laboratory are grappling with an invisible threat to the city of Reno. A swarm of earthquakes has been assaulting Reno's suburbs for a month. There were earthquakes occurring every day, uh, earthquakes of magnitude one and occasionally a magnitude three. The earthquakes were increasing in size, they were increasing in frequency, and the question began to play in people's minds, what's next? Again and again, the world has witnessed the unbelievable power earthquakes can unleash without warning. L'Aquila, Italy, 2009. A magnitude 6.3 earthquake rocks much of the country. Hundreds die. Tens of thousands left homeless. Sichuan, China, 2008. A magnitude 7.9 quake destroys more than 5 million buildings. The death toll exceeds 87,000. Northern Sumatra, 2004. One of the largest earthquakes ever measured, a 9.1, kills more than 227,000. In 2008, scientists in Nevada are faced with a terrifying prospect. The city of Reno may be headed for similar devastation. That was our fear that this could turn into a magnitude six or, or even a larger earthquake. In February, when residents of the Reno suburb of Mogul are caught off guard by the rumbling of a magnitude 2.2 earthquake. Maybe a pulse. Scientists initially don't believe this single small quake is a cause for concern. But in the days that follow, more small earthquakes hit just outside Reno. Because they were happening every every second or third day, we began to notice within a few days that this was being persistent. And that made it unusual. So within maybe a week, it was on our radar that uh, we need to keep an eye on this. In a normal earthquake sequence, a quake is typically followed by aftershocks of diminishing strength. But on March 8th, one of the earthquakes suddenly jumps above magnitude three. So threes are a lot bigger. Magnitude three is 30 times the kick of a magnitude two. A magnitude three is about the size of a football field rupturing in the earth. All of Reno would commonly feel a magnitude three. The quake passes in just seconds before doing much damage. But the escalating quakes now have everyone on edge. Reno 911, please fire medical. This, this house has been shaking and it just about shook me out of the bed every day this week. The earthquakes were occurring right under two uh, bedroom communities to Reno. Mogul, which is about 1,500 people, and Somerset, a little bit newer community, which was also about 1,500 people. So there's a big population base that could be affected by the earthquakes. And neither one of those locations are, you know, were on our list of places that we thought were high hazard for earthquake. Scientists hope that the magnitude three quake is a sign that the days of tremors might soon be over. We began to realize that, hey, uh, these small earthquakes are building up in what we would call a foreshock sequence, building up to this magnitude three. Our hope was that, that this was gonna be the main event. But the following week, another magnitude three quake strikes. Nine days later, there's another. Only two days after that, a fourth. And all the while, lab instruments are recording hundreds more micro-earthquakes too small to be felt. There's a dawning realization that something strange is happening on the outskirts of Reno. Have you been feeling these earthquakes out here? Yes, I certainly have, and they felt stronger than 3.0. 
At this point, we know we have something that's unusual on our hands. The, this puts it in a category of things that we call seismic swarms. A swarm is not a well-defined term, but I mean, generally speaking, you have a long, low intensity level activity. Seismologists have been tracking the daily number of earthquakes since the swarm began four weeks ago. Desperate for clues, they plot them onto a graph for analysis. The upper red line is the number of earthquakes of magnitude one or greater. At first, we have an earthquake every day or two, but by early March, you begin to see something of a pattern. You'll see a flurry of earthquakes, and then it backs off. But it picked up again, and there was a lull, and it picked up again, and there was a lull and it picked up again. What seems like a month of random quaking instead reveals itself as a steady rate of activity. And it's accelerating. There was plainly an acceleration in the, in the, if you will, in the daily rate. And this indicated a higher degree of activity to us. It became fairly clear early on that it wasn't going to go away uh, right away, certainly. And all of us were holding our breaths, waiting that the earthquakes would stop and we could be done. Seismologists struggle to understand the mysterious underground forces amassing against Reno's suburbs. Dr. John Anderson is the director of the Nevada Seismological Laboratory. To monitor the shaking, he and his team decide to deploy extra instruments in the affected towns. We could see events happening, but we didn't have any uh, station right there. Plus, we didn't really know the depths of the earthquakes. So what you really want to have is you want to have a station as close to the events as possible. Dr. Anderson chooses his own backyard for their initial deployment. Okay, so let's put it up on the hillside over there, okay? okay so. That's because he lives right in the heart of the town the swarm has targeted. My wife was feeling earthquakes daily. There had probably been a hundred earthquakes that were large enough that they had been felt. And that's a lot of earthquakes. They would just be a little shake. It would be over in less than a second. Whatever is going on here, we need to learn as much as we can. The team deploys state-of-the-art seismographs capable of detecting even the tiniest earthquakes. Well, this instrument is very sensitive. It, uh, actually, we are in Nevada, but we are capable of uh, uh, recording uh, ocean waves crashing into the shores in California. The instruments will record seismic waves, shock waves that ripple through the Earth's crust after an earthquake. That breaking of rock, the, the two sides moving past each other makes a lot of vibrations that go out, and those are the, the waves we feel at the Earth's surface. The fastest kind of seismic wave is called a primary, or P wave. This compression wave pushes and pulls the Earth as it moves through it. The P wave is followed by a secondary, or S wave, which rocks the Earth perpendicular to the direction it travels. Because S waves always travel slower than P waves, timing the waves allows seismologists to pinpoint an earthquake's point of origin. This is like a fast runner and a slow runner. And the farther away they go, the farther ahead the fast guy is. But with a little bit of algebra, you can tell, well, where, running time backwards, where could they have been at the same place at the same time? And they meet somewhere, and this is fundamentally how all earthquakes are located. The closer together the waves are when they reach a seismograph, the closer the source of the quake is. Once the lab's instruments are up and running, scientists will be able to pinpoint precisely where the swarm is coming from. We install these instruments by digging a hole and burying them. The, the reason we bury them is to have good contact with the ground, so when there's an earthquake, the instrument moves with the ground. In order to install them correctly, we have to level the instrument. So we level them by putting a concrete block at, and level that concrete block, and then we put the instrument in there. Once in place, they ready a second instrument, calibrated for larger earthquakes. We don't want to miss something. Anytime we miss getting records from a large earthquake, in a sense, it's sort of a missed opportunity. We want to get as much data as we can, as fast as we can, to help understand our seismic hazards. We didn't know when we put these instruments out if a big earthquake would happen. 
but we were confident that we were going to get some interesting data from this. As scientists wait for the data to come in, Reno's residents anxiously wait for answers. It's clear that something dangerous is developing beneath their homes. There's one a week at least, and we had three this weekend. I, it's really scary, I don't know, it makes you wonder what's gonna happen next. As the earthquakes continue through the end of March, dread grips Reno's residents. They fear their homes are directly in the sights of bigger, more damaging quakes yet to strike. And they're right. When the next quake strike Reno in March 2008, the equipment buried in John Anderson's backyard records only fractions of a second in between the different seismic waves. That means the director of the seismology lab lives on top of ground zero. Seismologists take the data being relayed from Reno's suburbs and create an interactive 3D model of the swarm. It provides a 360-degree view of the quakes and reveals how deep underground the Earth is shifting. The data gives scientists even more cause for alarm. The quakes are surprisingly close to the surface. It surely made sense why everybody was feeling them, because it was so shallow. The extent of the sequence goes down to about five to six kilometers. That's about the bottom of it. Uh, all the actions above shallower than six kilometers. And that's unusual in here because most of the earthquakes in this region are actually concentrated from about five to about 15 kilometers. Around this area, I can't recall an earthquake sequence of such a shallow nature. Residents are now confronted with the knowledge that the escalating earthquakes are directly under their homes and very close to the surface. It's like being near a bomb or a hand grenade. If you release a lot of energy shallow, then um, it's basically right under people's homes. The discovery only amplifies the anxiety over what could happen if a big quake hits. Part of the anxiety really here is that we are without a guide, as it were. It's unprecedented, and one never knows where an unprecedented thing will go. You begin to call your friends and say, have you guys seen anything like this? Scientists race to uncover Mother Nature's attack plan before she launches another strike. They start with what they already know about the forces brewing beneath them in Nevada. They try to match the area of the swarm's activity to maps of Nevada's fault lines. We live on a, a really dynamic Earth, and most of it is, is uh, very hot, uh, very mobile. Uh, we live on a very thin crust of frozen rock on this Earth, and the crust is broken up into a series of, of uh, they call them plates. They're, they're big pieces of the Earth that are all moving the same direction. Um, and it turns out that we're not far from the boundary of two of these plates in Nevada. Uh, the two plates would be the Pacific plate that goes from San Francisco to uh, Japan um, and the North American plate that goes from San Francisco more or less all the way to Iceland. Most earthquakes occur along places where the Earth's crust has cracked and shifted and grinds against itself, called fault lines. Typically that fault is stuck at the surface, so as the plates are moving, the stress is building up and building up and building up, and after hundreds or thousands of years, finally it, it ruptures, and that causes an earthquake. One side slips one way, the other side slips the other way. And uh, that sudden slip generates a seismic wave. It's not a straight line between the two plates as drawn in atlases or textbooks.